Hello, and welcome back to Mortals and Portals, a Pathfinder real play podcast. I'm your host and GM, Zach, and joining me at the table is... Adam, and I play Jules and Azar Ketty Bard. I'm Joel, and I play Dax, a kobold rogue. Ryan, I play Ryu, a tiefling magus. Taryn, and I play Waltz, a human champion. <laughs> that was right. sick, yo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this suddenly became like a gritty western just out of nowhere. Um, yeah, very cool, guys. That's like one of the first times you've all done the same uh, goofy voice. I'm and it's all your fault, Adam. Good job. Uh, it's all thanks to me. <laughs> yeah, I know sharply. everyone hates me. That's fine. Oh, Adam. <laughs> Woof. Uh, you may have noticed we're all here. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> cough, cough. <laughs> Adam, we told you that in confidence. Crickets. <laughs> <laughs> you each sent me a letter. Yeah, yeah. I should read them Words all. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Patreon bonus content. <laughs> Adam reads hate mail from, <laughs> from his friends. His friends. <laughs> <laughs> Become a patron, yeah. <laughs> hey, let's play Pathfinder. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, well, if you haven't noticed by now, all four of us are here this time, so we got our scheduling woes figured out. Uh, so yeah, we're gonna we're all gonna play today. Does that sound fun, guys? Even you, Ryan? Woohoo! Mm, I'll believe Heck it when I see yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, last time on Mortals and Portals, Ryu and Jules got in a big crazy fight in Kurapan, where they decided to sabotage a ship. Uh, well, Jules decided to, and he just completely jumped off Smith and left Ryu to his own devices, who then crashed Sorry. into a bunch of Drake Knights, who he then fought uh, enthusiastically as he transformed into his Pagos state that seems to correspond with the Arctic climate of the region, where he just loves killing people and talking trash and just being, you know, mean. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so he was absolutely pulverizing Drake Knights, having the time of his life. Uh, even Smith got in on the action. Meanwhile... Jules infiltrated a ship, uh, created some distractions with his sassy, unseen servant, <laughs> climbed into the lower deck, about that. only to find that a completely yoked out of his mind turtle folk was down there who wasn't quite buying uh, Jules's presence. He seemed to be a very savvy Drake Knight, very plugged in with who is and isn't a Drake Knight, didn't recognize this uh, gorgeous, handsome Squidward Azerketti, and, uh, you know, started <laughs> interrogating him a bit, and eventually said, like, if you don't convince me you're a Drake Knight in like a second, I'm going to rip you in half. And then Jules just decided, you know what? Let's go for it. So he tipped over a big old crate of Drake eggs, which he discovered that were marked to go to all the planets of Keldora, basically. So Sindor saying that he's only helping on the fight of Mandaru, or if you guys believe that or not, uh, clearly doesn't seem to be true. He's got some sort of inter-system network going on. And then he was trying to make his way to the Sunpowder, kind of fought through the Turtle folk, and then set some sun powder ablaze, dove out of the ship, blew up the whole thing, landed in the water. Meanwhile, Ryu is still fighting Drake Knights. And then Waltz and Dax infiltrated Skill Keep, and uh, Dax started to do some reconnaissance, trying to figure out what the Arcanor is. And meanwhile, Waltz got sucked into a big old party, basically, where all the Drake Knights are watching other Drake Knights fight to become Commander. So, Commander Krim's dead, you guys killed Captain Nelly. Bulger's gone and dead, not that they know that, and then the captain of Gainmar is off patrolling, maybe in case you guys show up. So they're, you know, there's kind of that void of Sindor's right-hand man, so they're having a fight to see who that is. Uh, Waltz is watching that, um, hanging out with his buddies, uh, Glorm, who I kept saying Gloin, it's just some stupid goblin name, alright? It's just one of, just whatever, like, <laughs> hey, glob, he's not blue, stupid. Blue, whatever you would think of. Uh, yeah, so Glorm and Whisk. And, uh, you know, Glorm really wanted to be on his shoulders, which actually ended up being about five to ten minutes of our episode. It was supposed to be a quick story <laughs> beat, but that, but that was a, a sizable chunk of that. <laughs> and then uh, Dax snuck around, um, was trying to find the Arknor, heard mention of a monkey man in the dungeons who he mm -hmm. uh, assumed to perhaps be Dunadas, because that's the only monkey man he knows. Uh, ended up stealing the keys, found his way down in the dungeon. Sure enough, Dunadas is down there. Meanwhile... Waltz watches this fight, sees Boric, this big beastkin, win the fight, and in the moment that he kills his foe and becomes the commander, Waltz has a vision of basically the entire scale keep, like, destroyed uh, signs that it's like a wasteland and all of your weapons are scattered about, like, he can tell that you guys perhaps die in this. He feels like that became the course of action the second Boric won. 
So he decided that he needed to become the leader of the Drake Knights in Challenge Borg. So he stepped up onto the platform. And then also Dax found Dunadest and was all gung-ho, ready to free him. And then Dunadest said, nope, you can't. In fact, you should kill me. And Dax said, why? And he says, well, I told Sindor if I got anything wrong with the Arcanor, it would basically create a massive explosion and explained that this explosion would be so massive it could basically destroy all of Nisreen, and Nisreen mean an island would then create a tidal wave, and that tidal wave would be coastbound for the mainland of Kyria and destroy the elven capital, which is where the entire elvish democracy and government is. Um, so now there's a lot more at stake. So yeah, he's like, kill me, because uh, I know how to do that, and if Sindor shows up, I know he'll be able to get that out of me with some sort of magical means. So you gotta kill me. And Dax said, uh, and that's where we ended our <laughs> session. So yeah, lots going on there. I'm scared. Mm-hmm. But we'll let that I simmer like the dark a bit. turn. And, uh, yeah, a little bit of a dark turn. And we're gonna check in on our, uh, our boys, Jules and Ryu. So, Ryu, you just pummeled a ton of Drake Knights running down the docks with your Gale Blast. But there's still a massive wave of them coming, so you've created somewhat of an opening. Is Ryu just going to hang firm and continue fighting? Is he getting out of there? What's he doing? Yeah, no way. Ryu's having too much of a good time right now. (laughs) Who wants some more? So you start to hear a lot of bells ringing in the distance. Um, You can kind of recognize that as an alarm being sound, you know, just like an Erekai horn or even... Uh, the Fangdom has bells whenever you guys like raid a city or anything like that. So you can tell that they've sounded the alarm. You hear lots of shouting, running, many Drake Knights coming towards you. You can see the mass of auras reforming, running back down the docks as you prepare. So you're going to attack them again? Uh, for my turn, I don't know if you see in movies where like people are like racing towards them and the person's just kind of holding their ground and they're like slashing as the people like yeah. come at them oh, sort yeah. of thing. <laughs> so you want to take like, like a, a ready action one at a time to slice basically. down each one? <laughs> yeah, that's what yeah, I want to go for. Yeah, I've seen 300. Yeah, that's what I thought of too. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So you want to just basically do an attack on each one as they come in? Yep. Well, I should let you know there's far more than three Drake Knights coming. You do understand this? <laughs> Um, yeah, you said I could have 50 actions, though, right? You said that. <laughs> you did say that, Zach. You did. I do remember uh, that. I didn't I think, think it was, was in a drunk. text. I only had half a beer. It was in episode eight. eight. You said it, yeah. Episode eight. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's the long lost episode eight. That must have gotten cut. <laughs> it did, yeah. Well, if I only get three actions, I guess I'll just kill three people at a time. All right. Cool. So you hunker down as they're all running towards you. You can tell the Drake Knights approaching you have confidence surely from the fact that there's so many of them. And what you have done is impressive, but it's kind of this matter of time before you can't keep up. So the first one sprints up to you. And he pulls out an axe and raises it high above his head and he's going to swing down. But you had your ready action, so roll your attack roll. Come on. 15. That hits. Eight damage. All right, you slice across the waist of this Drake Knight who stumbles for a moment. You can hear his blood pour down onto the docks. Uh, 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 but he's still standing there. Are you going to attack him again? Not going down, are you? Another 15. You're going to get it. Ooh, max damage on that one. That's uh, 16 damage. All right, so he goes to horizontally swing his axe again. And kind of in one swift motion, you cut his arm off and then spin and then slice through his waist and then cut through him into the next guy behind him. So we're going to do some cleaving damage here. Heck Not yeah. really sure if that's a Pathfinder rule, but it's something we've kind of done in our past D&D campaigns with hordes of enemies. If you have any leftover damage dealt when everyone's packed in, you can carry it on to the next guy. So as you slice through his waist, you then raise your sword up and slash across the throat of another Drake Knight. He falls to his knees. Everyone's like, come on, we, we gotta take him together. And Too you slow. have a third action left. Yep, I think it's minus 10 on this one, right? Yep. 13. That misses. Ah! You spin around as you hear that voice call out to the rest of the Drake Knights and swing, only you didn't expect that this one would have a shield, and you hear it clank off of a shield, and you hear many footsteps start to wrap around you, basically forming a circle of Drake Knights 
that are about to engulf you. I think the fatigue is even kind of starting to hit me at this point and missing that last swing. I'm just starting to heave some heavier breaths and my shoulders are kind of slumped and I'm pulling my sword down and letting it rest on the ground as I'm like preparing for whatever's next. Maybe getting some flashbacks to Ryu's origin where all of the fangdom flooded into the valley around just three drake knights and it was only a matter of time before they couldn't keep it up. Does sound familiar. Jules, you burst out of the water. I would say gasping for air, but... (laughs) <laughs> Jules can breathe underwater. <laughs> Looking around, you see a bunch of splinters falling onto the water, driftwood, flames on some wreckage, uh, maybe even some water raining down from the massive burst that occurred, admiring your work, maybe chuckling to yourself. And then you peer over and you hear bells ringing and horns sounding and you see Drake Knights flooding around and you catch a glimpse of real slashing through some drake knights before you lose sight of him as they start to wrap around him. What do you do? I'd like to see if I can find Smith. All right. Where's my boy at? Roll me a perception check. Uh, 12. Um, you look over and you just see a lot of drake knights and a mass of bodies, but you do kind of hear some of Smith's shrieks resonating from the crowd and know he is in the general area of Ryu, but you don't really have a visual on him. Okay. Um, I want to swim towards the shore. Okay. I guess I don't know if I really have any tactical, like, I'm going to end up in this specific spot, so I guess I'll just swim towards the shore. Okay. And what is your swim speed? 30 feet. And you're going to use all three actions on that? Am I that far away? Yeah, I'd say you're about 150 feet away. Would the uh, perception check probably was one action, though, yes. Yeah. So two, so 60 feet that time? Yep. Okay, then that is my turn for now. All right, so you start frantically swimming over to Ryu. Ryu, you're going to receive some attacks now. <laughs> Hang in there, buddy. <sighs> come, come on. 11 misses. He's about to shield bash you. You hear the swiping sound and you step backwards just out of range as he swipes his shield across. And then he's going to follow up with an attack with his weapon. And he nat ones. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> uh, very cool. Let me roll a percentage die for this guy. And Ryu's uh, luck is going strong. I'm so good at this game. Ryu, can you roll me damage for a sword attack? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Ooh, max. Okay. So then 16. All right. So then he goes to do the horizontal swing, but you duck down and then stab your sword up like into his armpit and then like out his back and just pull it out. And he twists over and falls over dead. (sighs) Too slow. And more feet come around you. Some more attacks coming your way. Does a 17 hit you? Nope. (laughs) Man, dude. All right. So you block a sword strike. Second one comes in. Does a 22 hit you? Ah. Yes. Eight damage slashes across the back of your thigh from behind as you're fighting someone in front of you. Another attack comes in. Does an 18 hit you? No. Man. All right. So you spin around after you got slashed in the back, block another sword strike. One more attack on this turn. And this one misses as well. And then another attack comes from behind. You do the Anakin Skywalker behind the back sword block as it clanks off of your blade. You're hanging in there strong. Love it. For the listeners out there who might be calculating my damage, my uh, inexorable iron also gives me two temporary hit points between turns now, so I actually only took six damage on that one. All right. That brings us to Rhea. Rhea, what do you do with your turn? (sighs) Hurry up, Jules. He's just thinking that to himself. Not that I necessarily know he's on his way, but I think my one-track mind is still kind of going strong, and I'm just all in trying to slash at these guys take down as many as I can sort of thing so I think I'm just going to go with three strikes here again All right. 15 that hits 15 damage alright you kill another one stab him straight through the stomach out his back pull out the blade don't even take time to relish in your kill he just falls to your knees on the next one I hope there are actual numbers you have behind how many drake knights exist and how many I'm taking out right now <laughs> <laughs> yeah they're <laughs> You're chipping away. There's probably <laughs> there's probably a number. <laughs> 20, not that. That hits. 15 more damage. Another kill. You horizontally <laughs> slash and cut one's head off. All right, last one definitely misses. 
All right. So you go to do another swing, and suddenly your sword feels a lot heavier as you've just been relentlessly fighting. And you go to swing, and you feel there's not enough power behind it, and another sword blocks your attack. You hear more footsteps coming down the docks. Keep pushing! He's about to break! (sighs) Just try it. Okay, and we'll cut back over to Jules. So Jules, you have about 90 feet left to go, and then you can make land and be within 30 feet of Ryu if you use your entire turn to swim. Uh, What do you do? Uh, Yeah, I will definitely do that. Definitely concerned about how much time he's been on his own facing all these Drake Knights. So whether I'm actually going faster or not, I feel like I'm just pedaling as hard as I've ever done before. So Hold on! And we'll come back to the Drake Knights. Another onslaught, another round of attacks. Does a 19 hit you? No. My goodness, man. (laughs) All right. Blocking blows, almost like spinning. I don't know if you've seen Last Samurai, but there's like a scene where Tom Cruise is like kind of cutting the leg and they're just all around him and he's spinning in a circle, just clanking off all their swords, maintaining distance around him. So that's sort of what I picture Ryu doing. Man, I wish I saw that movie. It's pretty cool. Someone on the YouTube did recommend that you watch Last Samurai in the episode where you... Oh, really? Yeah, where you were giving sword tips. They said just watch Last Samurai. Yeah, it's a, there's a guy the who comments Ronin. on a lot of our videos. He's awesome. Yeah, yeah it's Ronin. a great movie. Love that yeah. dude. Yeah. I yeah. like him because he likes me. <laughs> <laughs> I like him because he comments on all our YouTube videos. Dude, shout out to the Ronin, bro. Yeah. You're a good you're my uh, boy, listener. Ronin. We love you, dude. Okay, so here comes another attack. This one misses. Another miss. And a hit. So you're clanking off a bunch. You're hanging in there. You're feeling confident. Your sword's starting to feel heavy. You're out of breath. And then you get stabbed in the back for... Five damage grazes off your shoulder, slides across, comes back, cuts deep into your shoulder. And that'll take us back to you, Ryu. Can I sense jewels within my thought sense range? If you did, a, if you spent around, maybe doing a perception check, you perhaps could. Yeah, I think Ryu is realizing that he's starting to get pretty fatigued now and he's starting to get hit. His bloodthirsty rage is starting to wane a bit, maybe, and he's starting to think a little bit more tactfully. Uh, so I'll take a, I'll take an action to become more aware of my surroundings here. All right, roll me a perception check. Net twenty, great, <laughs> great. Thing I was just about to say it's going to have to be a good one. <laughs> That's um, twenty-five total. So your shoulder is just burning, your leg is burning, your arms just—you almost can't even feel them with just how long you've been holding this sword and swinging. You're fatigued, you're breathing heavy. You can just hear your heart pounding in your head, basically, with just how exhausted you are. And you just think back to your mother's teachings, the teaching of the Arakai, trying to remain calm and steady. You do an exhale amidst all the chaos, close your eyes and just really focus. And through this mass of auras that's just muddling up everything, overwhelming, you manage to sift through it and you feel the familiar aura of jewels coming out of the water nearby. I shift my head over to that aura there. And I recognize that we're going to need some space to move here, so I'll use Gale Blast to try and give myself a little bit of space here, maybe give Jules a little bit of an opportunity to either see me or for us to come up with some sort of plan together here. So, Zach, you just have to roll a fortitude save. All right, so you're completely encircled, and you're casting this out. So I rolled for all four quadrants surrounding you, Mm. and half of them succeeded and half of them failed i need you to roll me a d4 twice and i'm gonna <laughs> use that to pick the quadrant that failed nice succeed. i like it nice all right two and four okay so you're feeling very desperate you're channeling your aura with all your might some of the drake knights start to recognize what you're doing and they yell brace hold hold and you cast out gale blast it erupts outwards <laughs> All of the Drake Knights to your right, facing the sea, so the direction jewels are coming from, are thrown off of the docks and into the water, whereas the ones towards the land are all were able to brace, dig into the dock, and maintain their position. So as you do that, jewels, you can clearly see Ryu fully exposed as a bunch of Drake Knights are thrown into the water, and you see him standing there cut, bloody, breathing heavy and angling his body back to the Drake Knights that weren't thrown off. So that's the end of your turn, Ryu. And Jules, 
You have made land. You can see a fully exposed Ryu um, from the shoreline. He's up on the kind of the dock edge, and you can you can see him. Very concerned about how he looks. Jules is going to run up a, a bit, and as he's running, he notices that each step he's feeling splashes of water, like significant splashes. But he knows he's like never done that before, and so he feels this out of concern for his his buddy, this uh, this power within him. And almost instinctively, um, he yells to the rest of the Drake Knights that are still there on land. He yells, over here! A bunch of them whip their heads around. And then he lifts his foot up really high, and he stomps on the dock. And I'm going to cast Sea Surge. Ooh. So I stomp on nearby solid or liquid service. This is solid. And I send a surge of water that rushes away from me. Uh, in this case, I'm going to form its five foot thick. 10 foot high and 15 feet wide. And it moves 60 feet in the direction that I choose, Whoa. pushing larger objects. And then they make a fortitude save. All right, that sounds awesome. <laughs> uh, what do they got to beat? 19. Nice. All right, so this is the half that remained up on the docks. You're kind of angling it, carving off the back half, like kind of around Ryu. Um, try yeah. not to hit him, I'm assuming, All right? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. And what happens if they fail? So if they fail, they are knocked prone. Oof. Okay. If anyone critically failed, they'd also they'd be pushed 20 feet and take 3d6 bludgeoning. Oh my gosh. You guys are on one right now. So Jules, you stomp your foot and water starts to spawn from the cracks of the gravel of the beach as you run up to the docks, it starts to raise up around you and you thrust your arm forward as this tidal wave emanates towards these drake knights. Oh. Ah! How did he do that? Ah! And the first quadrant is just completely wiped out and carried away. You just see loose weapons carried away in the water. They're thrown 20 feet deep into the land and the second quadrant is overwhelmed and knocked prone in front of Ryu as the water splashes and clears out the Drake Knights that have surrounded Ryu, leaving him with just a few sparse ones in front of him that were out of the range of your spell, but completely opened up behind him. And you can see Smith with just a couple Drake Knights lagging around him, and you have cleared a massive opening for Ryu. Smith, get us out of here! Smith takes a bite out of the throat of one of the Drake Knights in front of him, throws <laughs> guts all over <laughs> and as he goes, ah! <laughs> dies right in front of him. Smith. Smith starts to stomp and buck and run towards you, and the bells in the distance continue to ring horns sounding, and as you're making your way towards Smith, you each start to hear a rumble in the distance uh -oh. that makes you pause for a moment. Turn your heads, peer across the river that divides Pagos and Gainmar, and you see a cloud like a sandstorm coming uh -huh. on the Gainmar side of the island. As you see a mound of sand raising in the distance that's churning, making its way towards the river, the Drake Knights start to chuckle. <laughs> You're in trouble now. And a burst of sand erupts upwards, and you hear a loud roar no! across Karos. Ah, ah crap. Good. As the wings of Desmar are revealed, sand falling off of him, and he pins his wings back and starts flying across the river into Pagos. And we will cut over. I knew <laughs> it. Uh-oh. <laughs> you jerk. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Waltz and Dax. All right, so Waltz, we're going to start with you. You just stepped onto the platform. You had a vision that led you to believe that Boric, being commander of the Drake Knights, would lead to destruction, perhaps the death of Digsby's crew, the failure, the victory for Sindor. Um, maybe with your head hung low, step up onto the platform. Everyone looks at you in bewilderment like they don't recognize you. Boric looks like he almost could care less who you are. Just rage and hate in his face. And the goblin that announced that he would be commander in his victory looks to you and says, And who is this Drake Knight? Another challenger? Yeah. Well, 
Not just any Drake Knight can challenge to be commander. How long have you been a Drake Knight? What have you done? What are your deeds? Th that that's Waltz. Yeah, yeah, that's Waltz. And you see Whisk and Glorm shoulder to shoulder making their way towards the platform. P uh, pick me up, Whisk, pick me up. Oh, yeah, here. See, I guess I could have done it. He puts Glorm on his shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> Glorm says, that's Waltz. He saved us uh, from a hippogriff. A a and he's so selfless, he even he even helped us feed Forgost and, and carried a deer the entire way to his lair by himself. He he's so selfless, he was with Commander Krim, and, and he loved him more than anyone. Yeah, that's true, he did. Yes, he, he loves the Drake Knights. He's a Drake Knight through and through. Isn't that right, Waltz? Yeah, Glorm, uh, it is. And, and, Waltz, he even put me on his shoulder so I could see the fight. And you look into the crowd, and there's lots of short gnomes and halflings that are almost like wiping a tear away. <laughs> <laughs> so, if Waltz became commander of the Drake Knights, we'd all be lucky. Yeah, yeah, really lucky. Yeah. I, uh, appreciate that, Glorm. Anything for you, Waltz. And the goblin that was sort of being the MC of this situation says, uh, okay, uh, very well. And he looks to Boric and says, are you ready? You did just have a fight of your own. He didn't even hit me. I don't mind. I'd love to kill again. And he's beating them all, like with one arm kind of on his other hand. You can just see his muscles flexing as he manipulates this insanely heavy weapon like it's nothing. So there's lots of chatter in the crowd. Uh, a lot of people who don't know who you are, they're excited by your presence, what that could mean. You're this unknown fighter, this unknown challenger. So there's lots of restlessness in the crowd, excitement. Some of the like smaller races are starting to get excited for you, kind of starting a, a chant of like, waltz, 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 waltz. Yes, he'll put us all on his shoulders. Yes. And they're all cheering and everyone's getting very, very excited. Waltz will initially hear the, uh, the crowd yelling and screaming and very slowly it all just kind of fades to him and all he can really hear is his heart beating and his breath he'll grab his shield with both hands and enter ever stand stance and he'll just walk towards boric here we go the goblin starts to get in the center to announce that things are going to start and boric just swipes him out of the way with his big hairy hand and the goblin tumbles back and falls off the platform and boric rests the maul on top of his shoulder as he starts to walk towards you. And with that, we'll cut over to Dax. So Dax, what do you do, my man? Dude, it has, you're asking me to end your life, and surely you must realize how big of an ask that is. The world is better with you here. The amount of knowledge that you have, the amount of good you could do with that knowledge, it's it's immeasurable. Oh, Dax, I appreciate that. It, but I'm afraid that's naive. This world is filled with people that will take advantage of minds like mine. Uh, what starts out as something pure and beneficial to the entire system quickly turns into a weapon. It's what happened with the Arcanor in the first place. And Sindor wants to do it again. And, and I failed the first time, but I won't fail this time. I won't allow him to get that information. Surely you understand. It's too important. Yeah, I can, I can understand why you feel like that. Feeling responsible for the first time this happened, I, I certainly understand where you're coming from. What can you tell me about the Arcanor? Is there anything I need to know about it before I go after it? He raises his head back up at you. Have you defeated the Drakes? Do you plan to fight Sindor? Or, or is the, the Arcanor, is that your play? We've taken out two of the Drakes so far. Walt and I are here. Jules and Ryu are on their way. I'm planning on... Seeing if I can't steal this Arcanor before Sindor can get his hands on it. Uh, I understand. So it's all coming to a head now. It is. Okay, I, I will tell you all you need to know, but Dax, you must promise me you will do as I ask. Dax will look down with a forlorn look and just kind of play back some of the stuff that's happened so far. Him ending up here through an act of betrayal, and then on the flip side with Digsby giving up his life to save his, and everything with Clag and Geldir. There's a lot that's been going on the last, I guess, few days, really. Everything seems to have 
played out as it should. And the people that have left no room for suspicion have all turned out to be good people. Um, Digsby, Dunadast, Toriel, and then those in the in Digsby's crew themselves in uh with with the party. So Dax will look up to Dunadast. For you, Dunadast, I'd I can do it. I I don't know what's gonna happen, but I know that you know more about this place, you know more about Sindor, you know more about everything that's going on than than I likely ever will. And you've never given me a reason to distrust you. And you've done nothing but help us. So yeah, I can... I can be the catalyst to... to end Sindor's reign. Dunadas lets out a sigh of relief. Thank you, Dex. And... believe me, this is... this is what must be done. I, I have lived a full life, and... my life's goal has been to undo the wrongs of my past and free this island and put a stop to Sindor. I, I've thought this through a million ways here in this cell. I am a man of science, of course. No matter which way you run these calculations, this is the ideal approach. Thank you. And now... I will uphold my end of the bargain. You see him thinking. Surely you saw the eyesore of a building when you walked in here. The one with the domed roof. Yes. That is surely where the Arkanor is kept. I sensed it on my arrival. It makes sense. He, he constructed the buildings around the place in which we forged the Arkanor once we channeled the ley line unleashed its power. Hmm. <sighs> Uh, you have two, two problems you must solve. One is getting into that building. Uh, the other is shutting off the Arkanor. We shall address the first. Hmm. First, the building is like any structure. Uh, it has walls that are made of stone. If you find a way to perhaps destroy them, you could gain entry that way. You seem better at this than I am. I'm, I'm sure that would draw a lot of attention, but it would get the job done. Uh, perhaps a last resort. Mm, surely there's some sunpowder or something around here you could make use of. Yeah, I'm sure there is. The other option is the door itself. I was not involved in whatever spell locks it. Sindor would have made sure nobody knew of how to unlock it, but... I caught a glimpse of it, and what Sindor has in primal magic, raw power he lacks in finesse. It's an abysmal spell, it has one fatal flaw. If you were to strike the center of it with uh, a similar power, you could short the circuit that powers it. Uh, it's elementary, really. If you could find a piece of Arcanite, perhaps, and strike the center of the spell... Look at the etchings, the runes, with great power. It would, like I said, short the circuit, but you must be a safe distance away. If you're too close and you strike it, it could create some sort of eruption. It could harm you. Uh, but you've already established that you're a good shot. <laughs> uh, thank you. What does this Arcanite look like? Is is this common? Yes, uh, Arcanate, uh, you would want to find something that looks like a, a gem, a crystal of sorts. It could be cut in many different shapes, uh, but it would have a holographic finish to it. Uh, mostly clear, but the light would shine through it, casting all sorts of spectacular colors. Uh, there's a good chance there's some around here. Uh, it would be a prized okay. possession of any that have it. Uh, but there is one other option. The Arcanor, it's configured to distribute the spell over Nisserine in equal quantity. That is why it is kept here at the center of the island. Uh, this is done by keeping the Arcanor upright. Uh, the spell, it's shot upward in a beam. Uh, if it's tilted off its axis in any way, it's programmed to shut off because the effects could be uh, random devastating. 
For this reason, there must be a hole in the roof, enabling the power of the Arcanor to escape and distribute amongst the island. Uh, but the problem is, uh, if you were to climb down this hole, you would be exposed to the Arcanor's power. It would be painful, uh, difficult to withstand, but if you had perhaps a chain of sorts that could at least withstand that for some duration and were able to withstand it yourself, you could perhaps get into the building undetected. Uh, I can't say I know what it's like to stand in the Arcanor stream, but I can't imagine it'll feel good. Okay. So you say if I turn it over, that'll shut it off. Is there a way to permanently disable it or destroy it so this yes. can't harm anyone ever? Yes, uh, if you tilt it off its axis, it will momentarily pause the spell. It will resume once placed in its original position. Uh, the ley line will still remain within the Arcanor. <sighs> to shut it off, uh, I suppose no one here in my absence would know how to do that safely. But, uh, as I mentioned when I met you on the tavern, Arcanate is not typically durable. You could surely destroy it, but what would happen, uh, I'm not sure. It would release the ley line again over scale keep. It would perhaps produce a blast that could kill anyone within a certain range. I, I don't know exactly, but just make sure if that's what you do, you're not standing next to it. All right, I, I think I might have an idea. Dunit asked, I can't thank you enough for... Everything that you've done for us, for Nisarine, for everybody around you. Um, I won't let your good deeds be forgotten. Thank you, Dax. And remember, no matter what happens, even if we defeated Sindor, there will always be someone that will want this knowledge. I don't know who he's told that I know of this. If you succeed here today, you will win a great battle, but I feel it's only the beginning. Sindor's reach is vast, and you can't simply halt his schemes without consequence. But, at least with my knowledge dying with me, such a weapon isn't something you'll have to worry about. Thank you. Dax will sit with his hands in his lap, just fidgeting with his sleeves of his, of his shirt, and he'll slip his dagger out and... He'll raise his left arm and take the dagger and start to cut away at the hem of his sleeve. And out of that, he will pull a small vial and hold it up to Dunadast. Dunadast, do you know what this is? He squints his eyes and chuckles. <laughs> Frithator, the peaceful poison. Yes. I've had it sewn in here for, for a while now. It's kind of interesting how things come full circle. I took part in a heist back home for some rare material as well, and I had this on me just in case I got captured. I never dreamed that I'd be using it on on someone else. Well, Dax, if there's any doubt in your mind, surely you know the peaceful poison only works on someone who is willing. Yeah. I'll stand up slowly definitely taking my time and I'll look down at the vial for a few seconds too long and pull the cork I'll start walking towards Dunadest you ready big guy he gives you a smile and a nod and that is where we'll end our session I don't feel so good Oh, Anybody please. else's GMs put I him in situations funny. like that? I'm sorry, Joel. I need really to go sorry, take a buddy. nap. Yeah, <laughs> it's just coconut water. <laughs> yeah, it's just coconut water. Yeah, he's just giving him some, like, coffee. Because Dune Dash loves coffee. Bye, Whatever you want to set yourself. All right, but Sweet you know what, moons. guys? Hey, I'm sorry, what? but you need to shut up. What? Because we're going to ah! talk about that in the downtime, and I feel like that's going to be a pretty meaty downtime. Because there's so many ways it could have gone. I created that situation. Joel has been texting me about it all week, trying to figure out, you know, what's at stake, if this needs to be done, how to do it, you know. And, yeah, we're going to hash that out in the downtime. Talk about what Joel was thinking. 
and just everything else that happened in the session, like Desmar showing up and Walt's having to get in a big old fight and maybe kill someone. So yeah, uh, yeah, we'll check that out in the downtime. So thank you so much for joining us. We love you guys. Thank you for making us podcast and listening to us because otherwise we're just editing and doing all this work for absolutely no reason at all. And I'd like to thank Joel, who does all of our editing for vocals. So Joel will have to cry over and over again as he listens to this <laughs> difficult decision that he's been wrestling with for weeks. And I would like to thank Taryn for all of his sound effects that he puts in there. So he can put in sad, uh, he can insert Ryan's sad violin music that'll probably be playing during this scene. And I would like to thank Adam, who does all of our original artwork. Um, yeah, it's uh, incredible. I don't know if you haven't seen it yet, but you should check out our Instagram, our Reddit, um, all that stuff, because it's some good stuff. And you're the man, Adam, so thank you. And I'd like to thank Ryan for all of his original music. That's right, I said original. We don't use any license-free, generic stuff. You know, plug and play. Ryan goes into the lab and handcrafts beautiful <laughs> music to enchant your very souls so thank you ryan for doing that thank you for enchanting our souls uh-huh. and uh thank you ryan Welcome. yeah we're all gonna go big, give each other a big old group hug right now and we'll see you next time oh can't wait Mortals. Uh-huh, you thought you were getting out of that you guys are idiots i think yeah, he wants idiots. to kill us <laughs> i think he wants us to die <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be dead just like us, idiots. <laughs> <laughs> Zach, Jules is never going to get to become an exotic dancer. That's his dream. <laughs> yeah, he has You can belly dance as you get evaporated from electricity. <laughs> <laughs> it's never too late. <laughs> he died doing what he loved. <laughs> <laughs>